Turn, if you would, this morning to Psalms chapter 32. I'll be reading uh, verses 1 and 2. Uh, it, uh, page 469 in your pew hymnal. Pew hymnal. <coughs> verses 1 and 2. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, but in whose spirit there is no guile. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. I pray now as we go into this service that our, you'll be preparing our hearts. Preparing our hearts for service, Father. And we pray now as we, as we uh, continue in your service that, that you would be with uh, the song leaders. Father, you'll be with Brother Tom as he brings our message. Open our hearts into your word. For these things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Good to see everybody here this morning. Uh, Marsha warned me of this, that I'll forget everything I'm supposed to be saying. But, but anyway, it's good to see everybody here this morning. If you're here for the first time, uh, there's a little visitor's card on the, the pew in, in, in front of you. Uh, just fill that out and drop it off the plate as it's passed around. We'll have a record of your attendance and also may, uh, how we can uh, serve you better. Uh, now, we like we, after welcoming the visitors here, we like to welcome the ones who are are listening by radio, watching on TV. Uh, we have a, another ministry here. It's, it's called the Bus Ministry. Uh, if you're watching or listening to us and and don't have a ride, uh, just call that number, uh, 359-4077. Uh, we'll be able to pick you up and bring you back home, and uh, we'll enjoy your visit with us. Uh, now, let's all stand and greet each other. Good morning. I don't know why everybody's sitting so far from me this morning because I did see some fear in some eyes when I came in with this this morning. I, are y'all thinking about being switched? Yeah. Well, there's, there's no need to worry because this is the one if you brought this in the house, Mama would have sent you back out for another one. So you guys don't have a clue what I'm talking about, do you? No, because y'all have never been switched. Well, that's a whole different story. That's a whole different story. We'll do that another day. 
Today I wanted to talk to you about the difference in these. Now, look, they've both been broken off of a tree. Now, this has been broken off for a while, looks like, because it's just dead. It's just a stick. Now, this one's still got some leaves. They're a little droopy, but... So if, if I took these two and put them out in the yard, dug a little hole, put them down there, put some water in them, would they make a tree? No, they wouldn't. They wouldn't. They'd just be sticks in the mud then, right? Yeah. They wouldn't do anything. They just, before long, this one would look just like this one. And they'd just be something that somebody would fuss about because they were in the yard and they had to mow over them. I won't name any names. But, but all that to say, there's something in the Bible that talks about these. Now, not these in particular, but, you know, we said these are never going to be a tree because they've broken away from the main tree. And if these had been, uh, somebody mentioned peach limbs this morning. Um, if they'd been peach tree limbs, they'd have never grown a peach, would they? They'd have never had fruit. Never had fruit. Well, let me read you a little verse out of the book of John. In John 15, it says, and these are the words of Christ. It says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. If man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Just like these branches can never be part of that tree again. They can never provide a place for the birds to light. They can never provide shade. They can never produce hackberries again. <laughs> they can never be of any good because they are not part of the tree. Now, you ask, what's that got to do with me? Well, we're part of the tree of life. We're part of Christ. We're like the branches from the vine. If we stay in Christ, we'll produce fruit. That means people will know that we're Christians. They will know our love just by the things we do and say. If we break away from Christ, we're dead just like these. Okay? So remember that. Don't ever let yourself be torn away from the body of Christ. All right, let's say our prayer. Lord, I praise you and I hope that, that each and every one of us in here will never allow ourselves to just become a stick in the mud, Lord. Let us go out each day and, and show your love to others and produce fruit, Lord, and remain close to you. I ask these things in your name. morning. Nice to have the children's message back this morning, wasn't it? I missed it. Amy does a great job with that. I learn something every week. I'm not sure about the kids, but I know I do. So if you will, please join me on page uh, 958 of your pew Bible, or if you brought your own Bible, that's fine. Romans 4, verses 1 through 8. Again, that's page 958. What then can we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? If Abraham was justified by works, then he has something to brag about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness. Now to one who works, pay is not considered as a gift, but as something owed. But to the one who does not work, but believes on him who declares righteous, the ungodly, his faith is credited for righteousness. Likewise, David also speaks of the blessings of the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. How happy those, who lawless, how happy those whose lawless acts are forgiven and whose sins are covered. How happy the man whom the Lord will never charge with sin. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of his word. Thank you. Let us join together to pray. Our Father, we thank you for grace, mercy, and peace through our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that you called us out from the world to become your people, that you've invited us to gather in your presence in a place like this, to sing your praise, to say our prayers to listen intently to your word and to respond in faith to the message that we hear today. We pray, our Father, that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, a heart to receive the good things that you have for those who love you. 
we thank you that in these moments together, your presence will be very real and powerful and wonderful, and we give you praise and thanks for orchestrating this whole, ver- this whole experience today in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, and God's people said, Let us stand. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. A time, Father, that we can give back just a small portion of what you've given us. Father, now as we go into this hour, we pray again for, for Tom. As he brings our message, Father, that would be one that we could take and use in our daily lives. Help those, Father, who, who don't have as, as we have. For it's your name I pray. Amen.
At the beginning of Romans chapter 6, and if you have your Bibles with you, I'd appreciate it if you would open to Romans 6 and uh, page 960 in the Pew Bible. And if you did not bring a Bible with you today, it would be a good thing if you would just take a Pew Bible and, and open it up and follow along today. We're going to look at a number of scriptures that will be important for our consideration today. At the beginning of Romans chapter 6, Paul asked, the more I think about it, a, a, a most astounding question. Romans chapter 6, he asks, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Now, he's told them that they are justified by faith. That entering into a relationship with Jesus Christ by faith is what brings us into a saving relationship with God. And it, it couldn't be any easier to understand or any clearer about the nature of this salvation. He said that there's a consequence to it. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ because of this faith. And not only that, we stand in this grace. We stand in this grace. And the picture of, of being firm and fixed and, and unmovable and that, that sort of good. That Christ died for the ungodly of the world so that we might live to righteousness. He's, he's that, that this salvation affects a magnificent transition and change in, in our lives. So why, when he gets to chapter 6 in the book of Romans, why does he ask that question, should Christians keep on sinning? Now, something about this does not compute. I, I wonder why he asked that question. Well, I, I know part of the answer to that question, part of the answer is that there were some people that heard the gospel of grace that Paul was preaching and they said, well, if God saves us on the basis of grace, then we might as well and we probably should sin and keep on sinning so that we get more grace. And Paul says, that's not, that's not the reason for my gospel. But there, I think there may be another reason why Paul was asking that question. It may have been because 
The picture of the saved life that Paul paints for us in all of his writings is that a life that is up here. A life that glorifies the Lord. A life that uh, majors in holiness and bringing glory to God because of that kind of holiness. Uh, a life that is characterized by righteousness. But in the life of the church and in the lives of many of the Christians that Paul was relating to, instead of being up here like this, they were down here like this. When Paul surveyed the lives of many of the churches, uh, of, of the people, the Christians in the churches where he ministered, it was difficult to tell the difference between the saved and the lost of the world. The churches were becoming gradually, increasingly worldly in the way that they were looking. And so Paul asked that question, should Christians go on sinning? And of course he answers that question, no. And you can answer that question for yourself. No, absolutely not. But we need to think about this. At the end of the chapter... Paul writes the scripture lesson for today, and I, I really would like for you to follow along. Uh, Romans 16, the second part of, of verse 9, uh, Romans 6, the second part of verse nine, 19. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time? From the things of which you are now ashamed. For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now, we may know those verses uh, as a part of the Roman road and may want to make a point that Romans 6.23 is a very important verse to reckon with. But listen to the heart of the apostle on the subject of ongoing sin in the Christian's life. Now, if we're going to speak meaningfully about grace and about spiritual discipline in the Christian life, we're going to have to examine ourselves very carefully under the direction of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is not going to be an easy series of talks that we're going to have together if we're going to get down and dirty about the reality of sin in the lives of Christians. That is, or let's personalize that, the reality of sin in my life, not just the pastor of the church, but every person in the pew. We need to get serious about this particular subject especially in light of taking bold stands as we as a congregation are doing, dealing with tough situations that, that involve people we love, but still having to be firm in the faith, uh, there's not going to be an end to dealing with these kinds of issues. I think these issues are going to accelerate into the future. So here's the simple truth of the sermon. And this is the theme that I want to look at for the next several weeks. Our sins are killing us, and God's grace is saving us. Listen, listen to those, those main verbs there, killing. Our sins are killing us. It's, it has to have that kind of an impact. We have to be able to say that my sins, what I do sinfully, brings death to my life. Now, you, you're, you're, you're thinking, well, I'm not dead. <laughs> I haven't died. Nothing really bad has happened to me. I'm free to do whatever I want to do. And, and I live a relatively good life. But the fact of the matter is, Scripture is abundantly clear that our sins are killing us. And in order to balance that conviction with compassion, we need to have the second side of that equation. God's grace is saving us. God's grace is saving us. So we're going to deal with that subject. And, and so I want to uh, look a little more carefully at it. First of all, I want you to know that God planted this idea of the law of sin and death with the man in the garden. From the very beginning, right, right after creation, putting 
putting the man in the garden and giving him a responsibility to fulfill the purpose of God, then um, uh, God stated this principle at the very beginning, before, before the fall, before anything went wrong, this is a principle that God built into creation. So we need to reckon with it. Genesis 2, verses 15 through 17. Page 2 in the Pew Bible, if you want to follow along with me, please do. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden, uh, in the Garden of Eden, to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. It's the law of sin and death. That's the principle that governs all of life implanted in the pristine creation, that pristine creation we have never known. This was a principle established even before things went, got messed up. God said to the man, if you go after experiencing both good and evil, if you want to add to all of the, the goodness of my, of my creation, God says, and you want to experience the whole realm of possible experiences, including evil, then you will die. Now, it sounds like not a bad thing to be wise, not a bad thing to be understanding, not a th bad thing to be experiential. From our perspective, that's what wisdom is made up of. Taking time and learning what is truly uh, good and right and, and, and true, that's, that's, a, that's the way to approach living wisely. But God says to, to the man, you will die. You sin, you die. You sin, you die. Now, literally it says dying, you will die. So understand this about Genesis 2.17. Genesis 2.17 is not sudden death. It is prolonged dying. It is spiritual death. It is first spiritual death because your spirit dies. And what happens when your spirit dies? You are unable to relate and interact and, and worship and and know God. That's the primary experience of this spiritual death. You cannot experience God. And in the life of a Christian who continues in sin, that Christian's spiritual sensitivities are dulled. And so that's why it's possible for us to live a life that some of the older translations call carnal. We can live as if there has been no change in our lives. There's no difference between us and someone who, who lives in the world. And our lives look all for all the world like we're just one of the guys. Just the same as any person walking the streets of Louisville. And this ought not be. Dying, you will die. You know what that means? Genesis chapter 3. The man and the woman covered themselves once they had sinned. You know what else they did? They hid from the Lord. Now once they had this open, no hiding, unashamed relationship with each other, now they're covering up. Now they're hiding something from each other and even from themselves. But more than that, God continues to be involved in his creation. He continues to move among us as he does. And the people, the, the, the man and the woman in the garden, hide themselves from him as if they could escape his presence. That's the spiritual death that begins to occur. We begin to cover up. We begin to hide from God. We begin to move away from each other. We begin to become very isolated and ultimately very alone and very ashamed. And that's the nature of this kind of spiritual death. Rebellion against God takes the place of obedience to the Lord. Communion. Devotion. Becomes a part of life. Not the center of life. God is being avoided when 
we're avoiding that. You know what? Devotion to yourself disrupts your devotion to God. You become exceedingly insensitive to the things of the Spirit. See, this death that, that God warned uh, the man about is, that, is at first a spiritual death, and that spiritual death infects all of us. That's the occasion for the gospel. That's the reason that God has provided a gospel. It is first a spiritual death, and then it is a physical death. Romans 5.12, page 959 in your pew Bible. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. We're all infected. We all have that problem. That's our, that's our go-to experience. That's the habits of the heart. That's what we have known from early childhood to the very present moment. We may have embraced Jesus as Savior in life, but this old sin nature still lingers within us and still influences how we behave, how we act, attitudes that we carry, how we interact with other people, and how we worship God. And there's a sort of deathly, prolonged dying taking place in the lives of many Christians. We're dead spiritually long before we die physically. Our sins are killing us. And God's grace is saving us. There's a passage in 1 John chapter 1 that deserves some careful attention. Uh, look at... Uh, 1 John uh, chapter 1, verse 5, page 1034 in your, in your Bible. Now, uh, I'm not going to do a full exposition of this text of Scripture right now. I'm, I'm saving that for tonight. But I, I want you to be aware of the basic message that is included uh, there. And, uh, and just sort of give you an outline, get you started on this. And I hope you're going to spend some time reading it uh, this afternoon or this afternoon. Uh, John writes, this is the message we heard from him and are proclaiming to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Now here's the aged Paul, uh, the aged apostle John thinking back over his experiences with Jesus. He writes earlier in this what we have seen, what we have heard, what we have handled, what we have uh, touched, you know, concerning the word of life. This, we're telling you this. We're talking about that. So he says, he says that. Now he says, this is the message. This is, the, boiled it down, this is, what God, this is what Jesus taught us. He said, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And, and then he goes to a series of these conditional sentences. These conditional sentences that have this if-then kind of a response. If this is the case, then this is the consequence. And, and those, those are interesting. There are especially uh, three very good ones in verses 8, 9, and 10 that I think you ought to pay some careful attention to. But there's a final statement after those conditional sentences in, in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 that, uh, that speak to the absolute sufficiency of Jesus to save us from sinning. There's an acknowledgement of the fact of sin. No one of us can deny the reality of sin in our lives but there's an answer, there's a solution, there's a, there's a deliverance from it. We need to come to terms with that deliverance from it. So here's the importance of the passage. that Though we all have sin in our lives, it is never okay to sin. Though sin is a reality affecting, infecting every one of us in this place, it is never, never, never okay to sin. Now, what that boils down to is it's not okay for you to drift away from the hope of the gospel or to take it in such a casual manner that, that uh, the real hope of the gospel to transform your life is just sort of forgotten. It's just put on the, on the, on the back burner. It's, it's, you know, it's on an upper shelf where it's out of sight, out of mind. The truth of the gospel that transforms life, that makes life completely new, that transforms it from being just earthly life into eternal life. What that means is that you not cause dissension and create obstacles in the fellowship contrary to sound doctrine. We're going to come back to that one in a few weeks. It's especially tragic when we Christians create those obstacles. 
to the real power of grace unfolding in life. Here's what happened. He transformed the gospel from being saved to serve to being saved so Jesus can serve us. You catch my distinction? A number of popular gospels and popular gospel preachers would tell us that Jesus is only in the blessing business. Because he's in the blessing business, you can count on him to give you anything you want. All you have to do is summon the correct measure of faith, say the right words, do these internal affirmations, you tell yourself the truth of scripture, but look at it carefully and you'll discover it's only a selected portion of the scriptures that very often do not deal with this subject that we're talking about today. I can see how this message would not fly for one minute in a church in Texas that is probably the biggest church in the United States here. Because in that church, Jesus is in the business of serving you, not you in the business of serving him. Saved for service. That's the reality of the Christian life. Transforming us from being so self-centered that we would become servants of the living God in the service of people all around us. You would not commit sexual sin of any kind. Whether we talk about uh, homosexual practice or heterosexual practice. By the way, scripture has a whole lot more to say to us heterosexuals about sinful behavior than it does to others. Did you notice that? And we all have the same problem with shame. For many of us, that addiction to some kind of sexual behavior is a source of great sorrow and we hide it. It's our thorn in the flesh. And there's a lot more of it floating around in the church than we care to admit. One pastoral colleague heard the statistic that one in two men actually had to change that statistic one in two people now not just men one in two people men and women in the church have a problem with pornography the pastor wanted to disprove that so he commissioned the elders of his church to do an anonymous kind of survey to get some people to answer honestly about about their experiences you know what he found that statistic is absolutely correct. One, you're it. One, you're it. Oh, Kenny. <laughs> David. Oh, Susan. Well, it comes right down to it. it's really not funny because of the secret experience that some people have with being caught up in a sexual addiction from which they cannot break free in their own strength. Not okay. It's not okay that you withhold your devotion from the Lord. Because the Bible says that Jesus is Lord and learning to respond to him as the Lord of life is what this salvation is all about. He is the Savior to be sure. But if you're going to grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus, you're going to grow in grace and knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And there's a truism that if he is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. Well, most of us are on a continuum somewhere along there. And if this is barely Lord of life and fully Lord of life over here, most of us are down on this end. That's the reality. That's why Paul asked his question, should Christians go on sinning? It's not right that we should tolerate in ourselves an evil, unbelieving heart that leads us to fall away from the living God. 
That's the problem that the Hebrew Christians were uh, dealing with, that the writer of Hebrews was trying to impress upon those, those believers, that there was something inside of them that allowed them to come face to face with grace and decide, not yet, later, or not at all, and would fall away from that grace, never to be able to be renewed in that grace again. See, sin in the life of a Christian dulls your spiritual sensitivity. And you can become so skilled and so practiced in it and so familiar with it and so engaged in that sin that you become virtually, virtually lost. I don't mean you lose your salvation. But I mean you lost all sensitivity to the things of the Spirit. It would not be right that you neglect meeting together with uh, your brothers and sisters in the church. The number one evidence that something has gone awry in our relationship with God is when we start missing church. It is really that simple. Because there's something about this gathering that makes it different from being the part of any other social organization in the world. And when we become really casual about church attendance and participation in worship, engaging in Bible study, and going on mission with a, on a ministry team, something is amiss in our basic relationship with Jesus Christ. For so many, Sunday morning is a crisis. A crisis of decision. Do I go to church today or not? Well, some answer that question on Thursday. I can't wait to be on the lake this weekend. And I'm not picking on fisher people. All kinds of things that are taking priority over engaging in worship in the lives of God's people. So Paul asks, should Christians go on sinning? Is it not true? Grace never tells you it's okay to commit sin. You don't have to keep on sinning, though you will never in this life completely master sin. It is never okay to to sin, our sins are killing us. And God's grace is saving us. There's so much more to, uh, for all of us to, to confront on this subject. Uh, there's too much to ignore, but there's too much to deal with in this particular service. It's, it's, it's important for us to become informed, but it's even urgent, more urgent for us to take some decisive action as we allow the Spirit of God to lead us in this soul searching that needs to take place in many of our lives. Truth is, every one of us has a struggle and has a, a problem and has a sin, a besetting sin to deal with. Our sins are killing us and God's grace is saving us think it's fortuitous that we come to this Lord's table today. I think that we need to anticipate what will happen as we worship together around this table in light of this word that we're hearing from God. So I'd like for you to do something. Would you close your eyes, please, and please don't look around. You see, in the Lord's Supper... We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's the death he died to redeem us from our sins. And this supper says Christ died for our sins. In the Lord's Supper, we act out taking the gospel to ourselves very, very personally. Not, not just as a matter of belief the right belief about the Lord's Supper, but we act it out, and it is an act of faith that 
moves us to take this supper. We have a few moments to meditate and confess our sins and seek the Lord's favor in our lives. It's, it's the grace of a spiritual renewal that can transpire in these few moments together. When we set ourselves apart, we sanctify ourselves to the Lord who loves us. We call him Lord and we submit to him as Lord. If you would embrace this table as I've described it today, then I invite you to partake as we serve the elements. We will eat the bread and drink the cup together. If you're a believer in Jesus and you want your life to be transformed, then receive this supper. Our Father, we thank you that you're in the saving business, that your salvation contemplates transforming our lives completely and one day removing us from this dreadful place where sin so abounds in life to a place that will be as pristine as it originally was when Christ comes again. Thank you for these moments. We pray you would work deeply in our hearts and lives to your glory, honor, and praise. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
to Jesus Christ. If there is some, something in your life that you need to deal with today, now, please deal with it. Don't put it off. It never gets any easier. But there's a commitment that needs to be made in your life. It's been there for a long time, but you just haven't done it. Now is the time. Don't put it off. If this is the time that you were meant to join First Baptist Church, then come. We're standing together and we're singing Jesus is the song as we sing together. This is your moment, your time to make a decision.